Morning. How's everyone today? We doing well? It's good to see everyone. I have a few things as we begin this morning. So the past few weeks, we've been doing some follow-up visits for, for those who came to Vacation Bible School who gave us some indication they didn't have a church home. And so uh, those things have been good and uh, really a blessing for those who've been able to come. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and I think in August, we're going to try to start uh, probably once a month, start going out and, and visiting uh, together. So um, anyway, but that, I'm not sure exactly when it'll be yet. It'll be the same day every month. Uh, so whether it's the first Monday, second Monday, something like that. Uh, we'll get that information out. But for those who were able to take part in that, uh, we certainly appreciate um, you taking time out of your, your week to come and, and do those things. Uh, secondly, for those who showed up yesterday to, to help work, Mrs. Wilson, I know, was thrilled. Um, it was... Uh, it was a lot of work, <laughs> so we needed every single person that was able to be there, and we had quite a, a good number, and so uh, that was exciting. If you want to know who was there, when we stand in just a moment, just listen, just listen around whoever's moaning and, and grunting, or perhaps uh, there's a few people, you might be able to look at their calves to see if they're sunburned. Uh, so there's different evidences that you can, you can look to to see who was, was able to make the church work day. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, it was, it was difficult work, um, hot, of course, uh, but really a blessing for, for, of course, her and then those of us who, who were able to make it yesterday. Um, it should come as no shock to us that when we do things like visitation or we do things like go and serve widows, that we walk away blessed because these are things that God has commanded us to do. And we're, when we're obedient to the command of our Lord, He blesses us. And that's, I mean, so it, it shouldn't surprise us um, that we, we, the ones who are, are working, are, are, are blessed by these things. Uh, thirdly, uh, in two weeks, I guess, Wednesday, July 27th, uh, we we're having a pie baking contest. Uh, so we're going to do life together, and we'll do we'll sing together. We'll, we'll look at God's word together, um, and then we will. We're, I'm actively pursuing some different judges for for our pie baking contest and rules. No, uh, <laughs> so like typically at life together, what we do is we gather, we sing together, we we look at scripture together, we pray together, and then we learn. Uh, a skill together. Uh, well, this this month, I'm going to teach everyone how to lose. Because I fully intend on winning the pie baking contest. So, if you want to participate in that, we'll get more information out ASAP. Um, but if, if you're scared, of course, you don't have to. But uh, it, it's going to be a fun time. So, we'll, we'll do all the same things, sing together, read God's word together. Um, and then we'll, we'll eat delicious pie, and we'll, we'll see who has been determined to be the winner. I'm trying to find judges outside of our, our church family, um, if, I, if I possibly can. Uh, so that, that's uh, Wednesday, July 27th. Then we have, uh, given our, our church vote a few weeks ago, we have two new deacons who have not yet been ordained. Uh, Josh Livingston and Ryan Sykes. And so July, Sunday, July 31st, during our AM service, as a part of our normal worship service, we'll, uh, we'll pray over those men. Uh, so that'll be Sunday, July 31st. And then we have on here promotion Sunday, August 7th. So I think Micah has a quick, a brief announcement, and then <clears throat> I will come back and pray, and we will begin worshiping together. Great. Now, uh... I just wanted to mention on behalf of the deacon body um, that uh, we, we put out the box for nominating elders. Uh, we've gotten done with the deacon process, so um, there are forms out there, the box is out there. Um, so we're planning to leave the box out there for approximately one month. So Sunday, the 21st of August, 
um, we'll put that out. But just, you know, a word on the forms. Want to make sure that we understand the seriousness behind this process, right? That you take time to pray, to think, uh, to read through your Bible on the qualifications and, and thinking about those men who you would nominate. So again, forms are out there, the box is out there. You got a month. So let's, let's uh, pray together and then we'll begin singing this morning. God, you are, are good and gracious and kind and uh, the, the evidence of your faithfulness is sprinkled throughout this building this morning. Um, God, we needn't look anywhere um, to see how big you are, how powerful you are, how gracious and kind and merciful you are. Um, and then looking to our fellow, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ Jesus, whom were lost um, following the course of this world, um, following the prince of the power of the air. Um, God, we were children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And yet while we were in that state, it's your grace has made us alive together with Christ Jesus. You have adopted us into your family. And so, God, we, we see your power and your faithfulness on display as we gather as brothers and sisters in Christ today. Um, you are a remarkable God. God, you are worthy of our worship, of loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, and God, yet so often we fail in that. Um, but God, as we embark upon this, this process of God seeking you as to which men you would have to leave our church, lead our church, um, God, we, we pray that you would grant us wisdom. We pray that you would provide these men whom are qualified according to your word. They might, that they might shepherd our, our souls. They might shepherd our, our family. Um, God, we know, uh, again, there's not a molecule that is floating around that is outside of your control. Uh, you control all things. And so we, we know that, that through this process, um, certainly you are in control of all of it. And we know that ultimately, as you do all things, um, you will do these things for the good of your people and for your own glory. Um, so we rejoice in that, knowing that no matter the outcome of, of the different things, the uncertainties and things, um, what is not uncertain is that you will receive glory. God, you will receive glory. Um, and so this morning as we gather, um, I pray that you would, um, you would be exalted, that Christ would be magnified as the only hope of salvation for sinners. Um, that as we, we sing and as we read and as your word is preached, um, Christ Jesus would be exalted. Um, your saints would be edified, shaped into the image of Christ, your son. We love you, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Good morning. If y'all would turn to Psalm chapter 23. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come here to worship you, to sing your praise, and to give you honor and glory. Father, we thank you for your word, the truth of God. Father, no matter what happens, no matter what we go through, we can always count on you. We can always be comforted by you. Father, through good days and through bad days, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, and it's all because of you. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, whom gave his life that we could have life. Father, as we continue through this morning service and throughout this nation, Father, may all your people do the things that are pleasing to you and the things that glorify your name. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat>
was called to go. morning. One of the finest days we have ever had. A pleasure to be alive. These words were written in the journal of a man named Lionel Greenstreet in late November 1915. Greenstreet was the first officer on the Imperial Transit Antarctic Expedition, otherwise known as the Endurance Expedition. He was one of 27 other men that were chosen by Sir Ernest Shackleton uh, to be a part of an expedition that had as its goal uh, to take a ship uh, through the tumultuous Weddell Sea off the coast of Antarctica, drop off six men and some dogs that would pull the sled. Um, they would, so they'd make landfall in Antarctica, they'd sled across the continent at the South Pole, and they'd be picked up directly across the continent in the Ross Sea. Um, the South Pole had already been 
reached uh, a few different times. So that wasn't good enough. That wasn't big enough for these early 19th century, 18th, whatever, uh, explorers. Now to recruit men for this expedition, uh, Shackleton put an ad in the London newspaper that read as follows. It says this, men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return is doubtful, honor and recognition in the uh, in event of success. I think we should put that in our elder recruitment. He had over 5,000 applications for that job description. On December 5th, 1914, the Endurance set sail for Antarctica. By January 18th, 19, 1914, merely a month later, a little over a month later, the ship was stuck in ice that was packed around it in the Weddell Sea. They would live on this boat stuck in ice until October 27th, uh, 1915. Um, enduring sub sub-zero temperatures, harvesting seal meat, and using seal blubber for oil. Enduring the, the Arctic winter, where the sun didn't come up from May through August. Finally, in late October, the ship began to give way to the ice that had packed in around it. It had become time for them to abandon ship. And so they did. They, they left the ship. They carried as much as they could off and they began to set up camp on a floe, which basically is a floating piece of ice. So they were living and sleeping on ice in temperatures that rarely got above zero degrees. It was a month after they had been living on this ice that Green Street wrote the words I read earlier. One of the finest days we have ever had, a pleasure to be alive. Now this entry and other entries of this crew, who they all seem to diary pretty well, um, led the author of the book, Shackleton's Incredible Adventure, to write this. This is what he wrote. He said, in this lonely world of ice and emptiness, they had achieved at least a limited kind of contentment. They had been tested and found not wanting. But this was just the beginning of a journey. They wouldn't see anyone alive again for almost two years. It's a, a tale of leadership, teamwork, and really just the will to survive. But when Alfred Lansing wrote those words, they had achieved a limited kind of contentment. He wasn't kidding. You see, we soon learned that this contentment that they had in that moment was very much circumstantial, dependent upon the circumstances and the environment that was around them. The uncertainty of the stability of the flow for which they were camping on, the sudden shifts in weather, the ever-waning food supply, the longing for home, all these things would soon be no noticeable in the diaries of these men. One day they're happy and content, the next they're not. They're fighting for survival. Now in our passage this morning, Paul writes of contentment. But this is an altogether different kind of contentment. This is a contentment we read that is not based upon any sort of circumstance or situation that the believer in Christ might find themselves in. Let's pray together, and then let's read Philippians 4, 10 through 13. God, you are a good God. Again, we, we reflect upon your goodness when we think upon the cross of Calvary upon which Christ Jesus, your son, died for us. God, we know that our response as Christians to the lost world around us, to the situations that we face in life, is a huge deal. God, we know that our contentment, our um, desire to be obedient no matter the circumstances um, is not grounded or founded upon anything that can happen to us in this life. But God, it's, it's founded in the truth that we are surrounded with this morning, that your grace is sufficient, that your son 
His, his blood is effective to save. God, the truth that we are in Christ um, and one with Jesus Christ, the truth that his strength is residing within us in his spirit. And so God, as we look at this passage, I pray that you would give us clarity that Christ Jesus would be exalted. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And we have been working our way verse by verse through the book of Philippians. Um, and this is the way it should be, walking verse by verse through a book. There are very many benefits um, to walking verse by verse through a, a book of, of scripture. Um, both for the preacher and for the, uh, the people that are hearing the word of God preached. Um, first of all, it aids in, in the plumbing, the depths of the beauty of God's word, because you receive it as God gave it. That is the goal, um, in order. It also best communicates that which God intended as the context of the passage has been developed through weeks of study and through weeks of proclaiming the word of God. And so context, friends, is key as we attempt to discern meaning and not misrepresent or misinterpret a passage. One of those verses that is often misrepresented and misinterpreted is in our passages, our passage this morning. Now, as, as Paul writes this letter, there are several points of context to remember that aids us in our understanding of these verses. Uh, first of all, it's, it's apparent that the Apostle Paul is under arrest as he writes these verses. He makes reference to his imprisonment in chapter 1, verse 7, in chapter 1, verse 17, uh, then he references the imperial guard in chapter 1, verse 13. Um, we also learn, as we read through this letter, that there are those who are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ out of selfish ambition uh, to sort of afflict Paul as he's in prison. We see this in chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, we also learn, as we read through this letter, that Paul is unsure of his future. He doesn't know if he's going to live and continue to be able to serve his churches or if he's going to die. We see this in chapter 1, verses 21 through 26. We also learn that the Apostle Paul, uh, as he's commenting upon his own suffering, says he's being poured out as a drink, drink offering. We see this in chapter 2 and verse 17. We also learn that as we keep reading through this little book, and in the beginning of chapter 3, that there were those who were trying to infect the churches that the Apostle Paul had planted with false doctrine, teaching that you can do something in order to earn your salvation. We see this in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. And still, as we keep reading through chapter 3, we learn that there are those who are walking as enemies of the cross of Christ, who are leading some astray by their godless lifestyles. We see this in chapter 3, verses 18 through 19. And this is just the immediate context of the book of Philippians. As we step back and we take a broader look at the life of the Apostle Paul, we see that he, his, his sufferings are abounding. Uh, the most extensive list of this we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and it's summarized in verse 23 when Paul says this, He has had far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. And, and Paul's turmoil, if we keep reading through 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, wasn't just physical. He says, on top of all of these things, also weighing on his shoulders and on his mind and on his heart was the anxiety that he had for all the churches. You see, the churches that he cared so deeply about were dealing with sin issues, doctrinal issues, division, various temptations, and... The opposition to the gospel of Christ was very aggressive. And this weighed very heavy on the heart of Paul, as it would any 
shepherd. And so there was external and internal struggle for the Apostle Paul. Um, he describes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 when Paul writes, We were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. Paul was just trying to live a faithful Christian life. But he was doing so in the midst of a contentious culture. So the picture has been painted. Let's read again what Paul says to this church. In verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you had revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had, not, you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. And so, beginning this text, we return again to a theme that is all over this little letter, and that's the theme of joy. Um, in, in verse 4, uh, Paul has commanded the church to be joyful, and now we see that the Apostle Paul himself is practicing what he was preaching. He's telling them, you must be joyful, and then he's showing them, I am rejoicing as I write this letter. And so if, if a shepherd's going to be able to say what Paul says at the end of Philippians chapter 3, be imitators of me and be imitators of those who are following my example, he better be practicing what he's preaching. And the Apostle Paul here is practicing what he is preaching. He is greatly rejoicing. Mega joy. It's an intense, profound joy. Now we've commented on this several times as we've been through this letter uh, but I don't think this is a theme that you can exhaust. How convicting is it that Paul seems to go out of his way to find joy in different things? Whereas, and maybe I should speak for myself, whereas I seem to find things to be discouraged by or to be anxious about. The Apostle Paul is finding things to be joyful in. It's like he has his joy radar up looking for things to encourage his joy. And in this instance, Paul is rejoicing because of the generosity and the concern of the church of Philippi. He says he rejoices in the Lord that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Now, what is Paul talking about? How have they expressed this concern? Well, it would seem uh, to be financial gifts uh, that, the, uh, that Paul had received at the hands of Epaphroditus sent by the church at Philippi. We see this in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25 when Paul writes, I have thought it necessary to send to you, well, yeah, Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. The church at Philippi had sent them, sent Epaphroditus to minister to the apostle Paul. And then in Philippians chapter 4 verses 15 through 18, Paul writes this, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help for, for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And so this revived concern that the Philippians had for Paul took the form of what seems to be a financial gift by the hands of Epaphroditus. It also seems from chapter 4, verse 15, that this church, um, at the very beginning of the proclamation of the gospel going out, they were extremely generous when he was in Macedonia and Thessalonica. Um, and yet there seems to be a time in which uh, they had stopped giving to the Apostle Paul. And yet here, when Paul is now in Rome, they have revived their concern for Paul and they had sent him a gift through the hands of Epaphroditus. So Paul makes this observation. But in showing appreciation, he also wants to clarify that their lack of giving for that time period between Macedonia, Thessalonica, and now wasn't because... Uh, of a lack of concern for the Apostle Paul, but it was because of a lack of opportunity. So in other words, they didn't have Venmo or Cash App at this point to just send Paul money. They didn't have an opportunity to give. He says, you were indeed concerned for me. 
but you had no opportunity. And so they hadn't had the opportunity to give. Now, we can only speculate as to why. But there's something else that Paul wants to clarify. And this is what he says. Not that I am speaking of being in need. Now, the word need uh, means something. um, It's to, to lack something that is essential. Something that you can't live life without. Paul wants the Philippians to understand that while he is rejoicing at their gifts and the concern, the revived concern that they have for him, uh, that his, his ministry, his proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he doesn't do for any sort of financial benefit. He also wants them to understand that his work and faithfulness is not dependent upon their gifts. He's like saying, if, if you still didn't have the opportunity to, to give me this gift, I'd still get up in the morning and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need. Well, there's a few things here I think we can glean. First of all, God doesn't need our money to accomplish what he is going to accomplish. We learn in the word of God that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And so if if I find myself thinking that God's working is somehow dependent upon my giving, first of all, I'm arrogant. Secondly, I'm wrong. In Genesis chapter 1, God had nothing to work with. And yet he spoke and produced the world. And praise the Lord, this is how God works. Because this is the same way that God works in salvation. When God looks at us, he doesn't deem and determine that we have something to offer offer him and thereby he saves us. But rather, when he sees us, he sees nothing. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are blinded to the things of God, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And yet, as he spoke in creation, said, let there be light, he says, let there be light, and it shines into our hearts to show us the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ. This is how God works. He doesn't need anything to work. In fact, this is often how he does work, because he then receives the glory. And so this morning... If you're sitting here today and you're not a Christian and you're thinking that you're totally unworthy of a relationship with God or you have nothing to offer God because of your sin, let me say to you, join the club. Look around. This room is awash with men and women, sinful men and women who have been saved, not because they had something to offer God, but because God doesn't need anything to work with when he saves a man. And so repent and have faith in Christ, and God will save you no matter the sin. And so God doesn't need our money to do that which he's going to do in the world today. Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 25 says this, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Secondly, I think we can glean that God's man or God's men cannot be driven by monetary gain. And this is what Paul wanted to make clear. We just saw a few weeks ago at the end of chapter 3 that there were those walking as enemies of the cross of Christ who were motivated by earthly gain. Their hearts were set on earthly things. Paul wanted to make sure that they knew he was not that. Paul didn't need money to do what God had called him to do. Even though according to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it was totally within his right to receive money based upon his work for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, we learn here that our giving to the local church, our giving to the ministers of the gospel of Christ, is not so God can now accomplish something he couldn't have otherwise, but rather our giving to the local church, our giving to ministers of the gospel of Christ, our giving to missions, however you want to frame it or word it, is simply to be obedient to the Lord and honor God. 1 Timothy chapter 5, 17 through 18. And this should be the motivation for your giving 
in my giving to the church of God. So friends, if you're not giving to the church of God, you are being disobedient to the Lord. Paul continues, he said, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Now, why isn't Paul speaking of being in need? Well, he tells us. He says he's learned something. The word learned communicates to us that all the varied varied experiences in his life had taught him something. This wasn't a lesson that he learned in one day, but throughout a lifetime. And what had Paul learned? Well, Paul had learned to be content in whatever situation he finds himself in. See, the situations in life had become the school that he had learned the art of contentment. Now, what is contentment? Contentment for the Apostle Paul was not this stoic idea of emotionless receiving of situations, like no matter what happens, there's no emotion. Uh, In fact, in chapter 3, we see Paul with tears uh, warning the church uh, uh, of the enemies that walk the enemies of the cross that are are walking in their midst. Um, Contentment for Paul didn't mean that there was a flippancy or a a frivolity of uh, his concern for the godless state of the world. So it's like, well, the world's going to do what the world's going to do. They're evil, and so I just won't concern myself with it. That's not the sort of contentment Paul's talking about. In fact, reflecting on the wickedness of the world... Um, Paul tells them in chapter 2, verse 15, that they are to shine as lights in the world, in the midst of darkness, thereby influencing the world for the cause of Christ. Contentment for Paul didn't mean that he was satisfied in his own sanctification and walk with the Lord. Well, I'm content with where I'm at in regards to my relationship with Christ Jesus. No, no, no. We learn in chapter 3 that Paul is pressing on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 7, he talks about God had not yet completed the work that was being done within him. Paul wanted to know Christ fully. So that's not what contentment means. So what is contentment for Paul, if not any of these things? Well, this is how I've defined it. For Paul, contentment is being unflappable and immovable in his faithfulness to the Lord no matter the situation he finds himself in. Contentment for Paul is being unflappable and immovable in his faithfulness to the Lord, no matter the situation he finds himself in. And Paul writes this, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So the result of this learning process, he says, I have learned, and then he says, I know, and I know. He says, I know twice. And the objects of this learned knowledge is how to be brought low and how to abound. Now, to be brought low essentially means that Paul had been made humble. Paul has learned and now knows how to be humbled in life. It seems this humiliation that he's referencing is the suffering that he was going through as he writes this very letter. Now, given that Paul contrasts to be humbled with abounding, and and given the fact that the Philippians sought to meet Paul's need with financial gifts, brought low, specifically, I think here means his, his living without the finances he really needs to live, living in poverty. So Paul has learned and knows how to be humbled and not let this affect his contentment. Now, life can be humbling, can't it? There are so many things that we deal with in life that are beyond our control. And as a result, this humbles us, as it should. This can take many various forms in life, and we could take a poll. And everyone has things going on in life that humble us. This could be financial loss or lack. This can be illness. This can be loss of a loved one and on and on. These things can bring us low. These things can humble us. 
But in this passage, friends, the humiliation in being brought low is not just a general trial that Paul was facing that just comes about to anyone as they just live life. You see, this being brought low seems to have come about for Paul at the hands of godless men who hate Christ and who hate Christ's people. You see, he had been brought low simply because he was trying to live a faithful Christian life. At the beginning of chapter 3, he writes that he has suffered the loss of all things for the sake of knowing Christ. You see, obedience and faithfulness that leads to suffering seem to be the story of Paul's life. And so as we think about these things, it's probably not hard for us to understand how Paul could become discontented with things that took place. Why, God, is this happening to your faithful child? Why, God, do the righteous seem to suffer and the wicked seem to prosper? Well, friends, we too live in the midst of a contentious culture that seems to have their crosshairs on Christians and their values. If you haven't noticed, the world isn't all ho-hum about Christians living out their Christianity in the public square. Yeah, go ahead, you can live your Christian life as long as you don't bother anybody else. And the moment we do, the moment we call people to righteousness and repentance, you will be called an intolerant hater, you'll be called an extremist, and this is simply by holding to a biblical worldview on certain trending topics. So how do we as Christians remain content and unflappable and immovable in our faithfulness to the Lord no matter the situation? Well, Paul doesn't just say he's learned how to be brought low. He also says he has learned how to abound. Now, the word, we know what this means. To abound would be to be prosperous. So Paul has learned to be content while abounding, while being prosperous. Now, we may wonder, why is it such a struggle to be content while prospering? Well, if you remember, I define contentment as being unflappable or immovable in our faithfulness to the Lord, no matter the situation. Well, we often read in Scripture that prosperity, material blessings abounding, doesn't necessarily mean a content heart or faithful obedience. In fact, I would say that often material blessings can lead to disobedience. We read this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12. Sweet is, the sweet, sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. The prosperous wants more and more prosperity. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Paul writes this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And then we have the story in, in all three of the synoptic gospels of the rich young man who didn't want to give up his possessions in order to follow Christ. You see, that man's contentment wasn't in simple obedience to the Lord, but it was in his abounding. And so if following the Lord caused this rich young man to be brought low or to be humbled, uh, it was a no-go. You see, the natural inclination of an unregenerate heart of a prosperous man is always more prosperity. And prosperity makes a terrible God. And so for Paul here, being content while abounding was something he also had to learn. And maybe you're living in this half of this verse right now. Maybe your business is thriving, but you still have an discontent heart. Well, you need to know that contentment doesn't necessarily walk hand in hand with abundance. Abundance, prosperity, material blessings is not the answer to a discontent heart. Christ is the answer to a discontent heart. See, the Christian, no matter the situation, brought low or abundance, will never be content unless they have learned what Paul has learned. And then Paul continues. He says, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret 
to facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. In any and every, those are the same word twice. All in all, that's what that means. All in all, the word circumstance isn't even in there. All in all, he says. Paul is emphasizing that there isn't one rogue scenario or possibility floating around in the future that will influence or take away from his contentment. He says, I have learned the secret. Now, this is interesting here, maybe not to you, but to me, the word we have for learned here is different than the one used in verse 11. Uh, This word communicates that Paul has come to learn some inside information. Um, It's actually all one word, learned the secret. It paints a picture almost of a curtain or veil being opened to give a sneak peek as to what's on the other side or something that's going to happen in the future. And this information, this inside information, has taught Paul how to face plenty, hunger, abundance, and need. And he chooses these words on purpose, showing us even the extremes of life cannot affect my contentment and everything in between. Now, what's this secret? Well, he tells us in verse 13. When Paul writes this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is one of the most oft-quoted verses in the Bible, and perhaps misquoted. Now, when I was in high school, many centuries ago, uh, I was very active in FCA, uh, super grateful for the ministry, the impact it had on my life. Um, my senior year of, of FCA, I was, for some reason, an officer, and um, the first meeting in high school, it was really pretty remarkable. We probably had no less than 120, 150 students on that first morning. Um, and on that morning, we handed out flyers, or not flyers, information sheets. We wanted to know who people were and whatnot. And one of the questions was, what is your fav- favorite Bible verse? Well, this one was second to none. It's like Philippians 4.13. Maybe they were you know, just looking off of each other's sheets or whatever. Philippians 4.13, Philippians 4.13. This verse is very popular amongst athletes. I mean, you do know that if you write it on your, your eye black, you're guaranteed victory. Right? That's how this, this works. Um, and so this verse is often ripped out of context and applied to whatever battle we're facing in that moment. I've got a tough opponent today, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Well, uh, despite common application, this verse doesn't mean that you'll meet your bench press goals or that your business will thrive necessarily. Now, the danger of misinterpreting this verse is that when things don't go our way and we don't have success in whatever battle it is we're facing, then two things have happened. Either I have failed God, and so he's punishing me for my failures, or God has failed me, and he's not being true to his promise. But both of those things are ridiculous. You see, being brought low doesn't mean you're being punished or that God has failed you. You see, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, isn't a golden ticket to victory. And that's why we must read these verses in context. When we read the word all, I can do all things. That takes us back to the things that we just saw. All in all, in each and every situation, I have learned the secret. So all doesn't necessarily mean all. It's defined by the context of the passage for which we're reading. You know, we can't climb up to the top of this building, jump off and flap our arms and say, well, God told me I can do all things. That's not how this works, and yet that's how some people treat this verse. All points us back to verse 12 when Paul says, in all in all, the same word, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. All things is not a declaration of certain victory in every situation in life. It doesn't mean that we won't be humiliated or hungry. But rather, it means that as we are humiliated and hungry, we can still be content 
and we can still be faithful and obedient even in that circumstance. Paul writes, I can do. I can do all things. This is a word that that means capable. I am capable. I am strengthened to do this, to have the strength to accomplish a task. Well, how do we get this strength? Well, the little prepositional phrase, through him, is of concern here. It's very, very important. We are able only through him. Some of your translations um, probably rightly translate it through Christ. You see, him takes us back to verse 10, where Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord. And so this indicates to us, or teaches us, that the source of our strength, to be content in all situations, to face hunger and plenty, to be brought low and to abound, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. We are able to find contentment as we are brought low and as we abound only through him because he gives us the strength to do so. Christ strengthens his people through his spirit and through his word. And that allows us to face the ebbs and flows of life and to remain remain constant in our contentment and to remain unflappable and immovable in our faithfulness to the Lord even as we face a contentious culture that does not like our Christianity. We look out at the world today and we wonder, how is the church going to succeed in this environment? By the strength of Christ. On December 23rd, 1915, we're going back here, as Shackleton, the man I told you about earlier, gave orders um, that he gave orders that the crew needed to pack up camp. Um, The flow that they had moved out onto because their boat was destroyed had begun to crack. So they needed to load everything up and they had to go find another flow that would keep them safe. Well, as he was doing this, he gathered his crew around him um, with their 27 eyes, well, they have two eyes apiece, uh, whatever, two eyes apiece, 27 people, their eyes staring at their captain. Um, He began to implore them and beg of them, you can't take everything with you. He knew that their survival in that moment was probably dependent upon how much stuff they were carrying. The more stuff they carried, the less chance they had for survival. And so they needed to be ruthless in ridding themselves of any unnecessary ounce. For their lives were of more value than anything they would leave behind. Well, as they're looking at him to lead by example... He took out some gold out of his pocket and he hurled it to the ground, showing them he was committed to what he had just told his crew. And then he took a Bible that was given to him by Queen Alexandra and he he placed it down on the snow. But before placing it down on the snow, he carefully tore out a page of the Bible containing Psalm chapter 23. It's the psalm that Chris read earlier. As we think about the contentious culture in which we live, as we think about being content, um, as the ebbs and flows of life come, as the lows and highs of life come that are all sure to hit us, and we wonder, how can we remain content? How can we remain faithful in the midst of this environment? We remain faithful, Christian, as we think upon the promises that we have in Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The secret to being content in all situations in life The secret 
to being content, even as we look out and we face a culture that does not like our Christ, is the fact that our, our Christ is with us, walking every step there, strengthening his people through the power of his spirit and through the reading of his word. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the promise that we have in this passage. That we can do all things through your son who gives us strength. We thank you that though we can't do this on our own, we can't remain content, we can't remain unflappable and immovable in our obedience to you without Christ's strength. But God, we, we thank you that we don't have to even think upon those things because you have promised to be with us in all of these things. For you are with us even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You are there. And so God, as, as we think about the impact that we want to make as, as Christians, as families, as, as a church in the world today, we, we don't do these things in our own strength. But your Son, our Savior, is strengthening us all along the way. God, we know that this promise is true for your people. And so whether we're, we're talking uh, an older person, a younger person, God, whether, whether we think we are alone in this world or not, we know we are not alone because Christ is with us and empowering us to live the life that he has called us to live. Um, God, we, we thank you this morning that we've been able to gather and look into your word and, and sing praises unto you. God, we pray that as the word of God has been preached, um, that it would take anchor in the hearts of your people, that your Holy Spirit would use it to convict sinners. The Holy Spirit of God will, will show sinners that Christ is better, that Christ is the answer to a discontent heart. We pray that all these things would be to your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would stand as we sing. I'll be singing as well, um, but if, if anyone wants to talk about the gospel, um, talk about Christ, talk about what it really means to have a content heart in Christ Jesus, I, I would love to have that conversation all afternoon if it takes it, um, but let's sing together.
Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this message that you uh, brought, Lord. I thank you. Uh, I pray that we will be uh, in this world, not of this world, Lord. I pray that we will uh, be the light that you call us to be, Lord. I uh, pray for our community, Lord, that uh, and our country, Lord, that we will turn to you, Lord, and, and look to you for guidance, Lord. And I pray that you'll be with us all throughout this week and uh, watch over and protect us and bring us back here safely next week. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.